So my agent called me and she said, Hello Sunshine is making this show called Daisy Jones and the Six. I'd never read it, no idea what it was, and I just thought, I'm Daisy Jones. <laughs> I have had a lot of experience with musicians. Um, even though I'm not a musician, I'm not a record producer, but a lot of my friends are. And I saw an opportunity to tap into a history that I've got and, and actually just learn, you know, more about, about how a record comes together. Who wouldn't want to play Teddy Price? You guys missed out. I'm Teddy Price. The price is right. The, the characters speak for themselves. The story speaks for itself. It's, it's just such a wonderfully rich and exciting and dramatic story with great, well, kind of rounded and real characters that have a, you know, with the storyline, it's still very relatable now um, in so many ways. It just really spoke to me personally. I, I think it would speak to anyone. That's what's kind of wonderful about it. But for me, especially like the things that, the struggles that Billy's goes through uh, were very very close to home in so many ways not the alcohol and the drugs but <laughs> but so many aspects of his sort of relationships and his sort of struggles in that respect were, were you know things that I was going through or had been through and so I I just I was kind of desperate to be a part of it once I'd read it. I could tell that Taylor Jenkins Reid she's somebody that's interested in not like kind of why people are famous but also like what's it actually like to live that life which I don't think we always think or explore that much. I was left with like a very full but aching heart after reading the book and everyone's incredibly flawed but you don't hate them for it you kind of you love them and you feel connected to all of them so I was very excited when this um when the show came around. My agent called me and she said Hello Sunshine is making this show called Daisy Jones and the Six. I'd never read it, no idea what it was, and I just thought, I'm Daisy Jones. <laughs> we got off the phone, and I was like, I want, I want that. When I first got it in my hands, it was like, how do I access this well of compassion and patience, looking beyond someone who is first struggles with substance abuse and also just very selfish. Stepping into that place of belief in the goodness of someone. Oh, Camilla to me is like the ultimate secure powerhouse woman. Like she's everything that I would want to be. And I think like most women would just look at her, you know, with her, with her confidence and her so much self assurance. And she's such a decisive person who just kind of knows what's wrong and what's right always. So I think that I really wanted to, to play a woman who, who knows herself so well. The thing that attracted me to playing Eddie, I mean, honestly, it's kind of a dream role for me, really, um, to be playing a musician. Uh, I've been playing music since I was 11 years old. So to have the opportunity to play something that feels so familiar to me, it's, uh, that was hugely appealing. Plus, this is, it was a great script, a great book, great characters. There's nothing that I could not want to do about this job. <laughs> Daisy is like the ultimate Stevie Nicks, sexy, you know, effortless. It's like she's cool without ever even trying to be cool. You know, she's just got that that thing that is hard to put your finger on. And, and she's a star, you know, when she gets on stage. And she's a very lovable character and a very broken character. She's brash, but she's got an, an incredible amount of fire. And she's not starstruck, she's not overwhelmed, she's not, she's not flirty. She's basically like, well, do you want a cup of coffee or don't you? Why are you talking to me about this music thing? And Teddy kind of respects that. He, you know, he respects someone who's gonna stand up on their own and, and look him in the eye and speak directly uh, about what it is they're feeling or thinking. But she's wrong and she's very connected to the spirit of the soul. And then you have Daisy, of course, who you always forgive Daisy for her shortcomings or her lateness or her drama because she also just delivers every time and the way that she sings is incredibly moving. There's something very intriguing about a woman who's able to be so herself 
and so integral to her desires in all spaces she inhabits. That's a bit revolutionary for the times, still is today. So it's a bit of like, oh wow, how does how does that happen? Initially, you know, Daisy is this musician who they write one single with. It, she comes in the studio and it's a hit. So it kind of becomes the thing that the band is known for, is having these two singers that are working really well together. And I think initially when she joins the band, it's like, it's just a big win. Billy uh, is played by Sam Claflin. He's my older brother in the show. And um, yeah, we grew up in Pittsburgh together, started the band, and it's definitely a, a really loving, but also fraught relationship. Well, he, he's the, the sort of older brother of everyone. You know, he's, he's almost a father figure to all of them. Because he kind of grew up without a father, he sort of takes on that role. And it means the world to him, I think, to kind of make sure that everyone's okay. But m mostly that he's sort of very ambitious and he's very passionate about his work. That driving force, that determination, that resilience to kind of always, he's such a perfectionist that, you know, he's the right man to be at the, the, the sort of forefront of the band. I think, I think so many people can, can uh, relate to this, but like when someone is so passionate about their work, they kind of get lost in, in the sort of magic of it. And that's, you know, inevitably what happens to him. And I think the magic of the drugs, the magic of the, the alcohol, the dependency, um, the fact that he's so scarred from like his father leaving and his upbringing in a sense, that they're his weaknesses and he carries them with him and he thinks that the drugs and the alcohol help, but actually they're just hiding the problem. Billy, who's just like a torpedo, he's pissed off with everyone. Like you've always got their dynamic. Everybody's always, everybody's like doesn't ever know what's, you know, how, how things are going to play out in the session. When you're creating, everybody's egos and insecurities are like risen to the max. And then you've got the whole, um, just the pressure of, of success and trying to get successful and how to deal with it when it happens. Graham is, uh, I mean, I think about him as he functions within this group a lot and he's definitely the peacemaker or one of them for sure. Um, trying to constantly balance uh, and, and take care of his brother and also kind of growing into taking up his own space eventually and uh, playing less of that role. He's kind of always very sweet natured. Um, he has quite quite a volatile big brother. He's always like a little bit more reserved. Like he's, he just has a lovely, a lovely sweetness to him. A just raw talent that, that, that shines through. He's just, he's just a kid, but his guitar work is very special. And Teddy recognizes that his guitar sound his tone and his playing really adds a, a beautiful rock and roll element to what the group is doing. Yeah, Eddie and Warren are, uh, you know, those like grade school friends that, uh, I mean, usually there's a certain amount of separation from, but in this story, in this instance, we, uh, we stick together for a, a good long while. I love his character, actually. He's like kind of strangely off in a weird way. He's definitely always kind of like brooding and slightly irritated by by everything. I think he kind of, he's always wanting like a bit more of center stage and um, he's not always that comfortable with kind of being, uh, having to like step back. Eddie's a frustrated, you know, hard rock guitarist. Uh, and he believes that he should be stepping in and doing more and taking the lead more than just relying upon Billy. But he's comfortable in sitting back and, and enjoying the ride as well. You know, I, I could kind of count on him to a certain extent. Eddie is a musician with a chip on his shoulder, which is the very shortest format really of that. And I wanted to be really careful about how I played that without being too one note sort of thing. A lot of his issues kind of come from a good place in a way, and that perhaps he kind of loves Billy, really, and always just wanted his respect and the opportunity to be seen as an equal by him, which he never gives him. And it's kind of this deterioration of goodwill, um, whereby, you know, the end of the story, he's just had enough of not being recognized for his own talents and constantly kind of being downtrodden by the person who everybody seems to worship, you know? 
Uh, so it goes from love into bitterness, and Eddie is constantly told what to do and what to play. Um, and so the dynamic of him in the band, he doesn't really get to bring much to it apart from his friendship and camaraderie with the others. You know, but musically speaking, he's, it's almost like he's being handed sheet music, which is one of the things that upsets him. Eddie's not happy a lot of the time with what's going on. Um, so yeah, I think it creates some friction in the band. Simone, I think she's extremely driven, hardworking, talented, but also a little bit rigid. I think she's very smart on how to navigate the hierarchies of the music industry. Simone is the first friend Daisy ever makes. Maybe the only friend that Daisy ever has. And so I think it was a really the first time Daisy's connected with anybody. And she's the first person who believes in Daisy who inspires Daisy. I believe that Simone is is the daughter Teddy never had. The, the thing that Teddy really appreciates about Simone is that she sees the big picture. Karen's the most experienced member of the band. And sometimes Teddy looks to Karen to see what her reaction is to what's happening in the, in the group dynamic, the band dynamic, because she's been around this a lot longer than they have. So she's really solid. Karen is a, a total badass, really killer musician, and uh, really beautiful. What I really liked about Karen and what's interesting is when Daisy arrives, she understands what role she has to take on. She was an early adopter of understanding like how to, how to kind of like fit into this very male dominated arena that she was in, especially with music. I mean, like it was an incredibly much more misogynistic time than, than we're in now, obviously. And um, she had she has to fight for her place. I mean, the boys sometimes say like, you know, you're not even a, you're not even a girl. And she obviously is, and she's feminine. And she's, you know, glamorous as well. But um, she's constantly aware of uh, how to maintain her power within the group. You know, in the 70s, like, it's hard now, but to be a female in rock and roll would, would have been very intense. And I think there's a camaraderie there naturally because you're going, okay, another woman and all these guys and, you know, trying to hold my own here. And um, Karen does it so beautifully. And I think Karen actually sets an example for Daisy because Karen is opinionated and she doesn't do, you know, what she doesn't want to do. Warren is the, um, Warren's the drummer. He's definitely the silliest one in the band. Um, He's just always got his drumsticks. He's always, he just it feels like he's always tapping something. He's been hilarious, actually. Um, Sebastian has played him so beautifully. And uh, yeah, he's just always just being a real silly sausage. He's the clown. He's the one who's going to keep everybody's energy up and you need that person in a creative construction like this. A lot of the time, I think he really keeps the band together. He reminds everyone to be appreciative of, of where we're at. You know, there's a couple of moments throughout the show where people get caught up in drama. They get caught up in like the difficulty of being in this big fame monster. And Warren is just like, you could always look to Warren to be like, okay, cool. Like, let me chill out. He's like, I should be more like Warren. You know what I'm saying? He's amazing. He's like, uh, he's all physical, you know? He's just like, he likes like a good beer. He's distracted by women and drugs and he loves sports and banging on things. And he's just like this really good natured individual who like, even when things get to their most dramatic, he's just having a great time. Yeah, I think Camilla's the honorary sixth member of the band, or at least I like to think of her that way. And I think that when Karen kind of mentions that, I think it's really, it really warms her heart because in a lot of ways, you know, she was a big inspiration in moving to California and, and the band coming together and bringing Karen in and bringing Daisy in. And she really has a really good outside perspective as to like what the band needs and when, and she finds them their first home and, you know, the whole Teddy Price thing. So I think that Camille's kind of like the biggest groupie fan in the best way and um, their number one cheerleader and I think she's like the glue that keeps everything together. Camilla just has like the most beautiful like warmth and 
I love that. I love the kind of the family side of her and the care that she has for her daughter. It's beautiful. And then I also just love her transition. We also get this other side of Cammy's character, which you think she's one thing and you get all these different sides to her. But again, it's just like, it's so fun. Like those are, those are the kinds of woman characters that I like to see where it's like, it's just, we, we just get all of it and we appreciate all of it. I think that Camila is kind of everything that Daisy feels like she can't be. I think Daisy feels deeply that she's not that type of woman and not the nurturing kind of mothering, like she's got a lot of her own issues with her own mother. I don't, I think Daisy feels like she can't, couldn't be a mother, you know, for this sort of portion of her life. And I think Camila kind of triggers those things in her of feeling shame. She's the ideal woman to Daisy, I think. You know, she's kind of this strong, amazing um, mother and wife and smart and funny and kind. And so I think that there's that. But I also think that um, I think that there's something that Daisy responds to with her own um, desire to, ha to be mothered. She finds Camilla really, really very comforting and feels like she can open up to her. Teddy Price um, is a music producer, first and foremost. But to Billy, when Billy, you know, he, he's sort of a, someone that Billy has idolized his entire life. He, the, the songs that Teddy Price has produced, Billy has listened to, you know, inside and out. To have this man in his life is, is a dream come true, just as a musical standpoint. At the same time, there's, there's something in Teddy and his sort of previous experiences with and run-ins with addiction and, you know, the loss of, of someone through that. He kind of takes Billy under his wing. He looks after Billy. He, he, he kind of, he's, he's like the father figure, the father that Billy never had. Teddy was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. His parents had different expectations for him. Uh, he wound up skipping school, playing music. After high school, he, he, got a, he got a gig, he went to Paris, he did a whole bunch of stuff. He then moved into producing Dionne Warwick um, and Sam Cooke, um, a lot of R&B acts. Some of them became big hits. And uh, Teddy is all about the work. You know, it, it, he believes that music is the soundtrack of your soul. Music comes first for Teddy, um, and then relationships come second. So he's suffered a little bit in his private life, but he feels as though it is worth it because he is here to, to, to create music. Um, that's his, his, his prime focus. Teddy is a top-notch music producer. I'd say... Simone's and Teddy's relationship is definitely a um, father-daughter bond, for sure, and I think it's mutual. Teddy kind of pursues Daisy and goes and finds her at work, and I think Daisy inherently is somebody that is resistant to people trying to mold her or, you know, authority even. Or, and also, like, she hasn't had a great relationship with men thus far in the show. You know, um, she's had about a lot of experiences where things are being taken from her. And so she feels protective of her art. But Teddy doesn't, you know, he's a wonderful person um, and doesn't, you know, let it go and is persistent. And, you know, she says he's the, only, he's the first person who kind of made her want to live up to somebody else's expectations. I think as an actor, it's a blessing to have the opportunity to play a character from, from young to old, you know, to kind of really track through the different moments in the hi history, um, because I think they're the things that shape us into who we are. So you're not making one decision, you kind of, you get to live those moments and uh, explore them and experience them, which kind of helps you kind of really understand, like reading the script helped me understand who he is, the, the heart of it. To have 10 hours worth of debt is, is a lot better than just like a, a two hour film, you know? The most fun and challenging parts of playing somebody over decades, definitely like the evolution of the character. 
you know, Daisy starts as very young and then ends up as a big rock star who's older. And, you know, so it is kind of difficult navigating that, especially when you're jumping back and forth from like episode one to five and think, you know, so it, that's definitely um, complicated, but the scripts are incredible and they really help with that development. Um, so just being authentic in the moment, trying to be present in where she's at in her life. That was like the scariest part for me of this whole thing was shooting the 50 year old version of, of Camilla because it's so hard to be 50 when you've never been 50 before and kind of, you know, the mannerisms and of course what Camilla's secretly going through is like a whole other level and layer. So it was just so hard. I mean, I, I had to trust that like the prosthetics helped and, you know, kind of put Camilla in that zone, but that was really hard. Like I've never been in something where you've seen the person from 14 to 47, you know? Definitely a challenge, especially because we've been shooting the show in two blocks, kind of like a movie, like in one day, we'll shoot episodes one through five. Like, I'll put the mustache on, take the mustache off. Like, now you're high on drugs. Now you're a teenager. Now you're, you know, you're feeling this way, you're feeling that way. Like, you kind of, on the call sheet every day, they have what year it is with every scene. And that's hugely useful because you're like, okay, cool, 1973, where am I at? Where are we at? What are we doing? You know, and uh, Keeping up with all that is, is kind of like a fun little game to play. You know? <laughs> what was challenging was definitely, Simone does a lot of, um, I call it uh, silencing and swallowing pride. That was not fun. And I felt very protective of her. We have the opportunity to play ourselves at 17 years old and 30 and up to 40. And you know, in present day, we're playing ourselves at 40, kind of doing this kind of thing. <laughs> I find playing different ages uh, I think that's a really interesting concept and uh, it's it's fun to have the opportunity to try and get myself in the different headspaces of you know it's, and it's very subtle I suppose it's not going to be anything crazy but you know just having different energy levels and different ways of thinking like what have you learned by that point and I guess it's kind of harder for me to play the first part where you're having the nerves and feeling a bit younger for some reason it kind of easier to play the uh, bravado than it is the the sensitivity. 